In March 2011, Lotus Motorsport took the decision to compete in the greatest endurance race in the world, the Le Mans 24 Hours. This was more bold than it sounds because the team had just four months to be ready. This is a tale of ambition, talent and achievement. Le Mans 24 Hours is a, is a pinnacle of the endurance uh, worldwide and they are a high level competitor like Ferrari, Porsche, BMW, Corvette. And to put our Lotus Evoir in the middle of the group, for me, is a big, a big value for Lotus. Everyone is pushing, everyone wants this car to be out on the track, competitive. And that's what you need, you know, when you're doing the hours and the commitments, you need passion from everybody. It, it's not financial return, it's, it's pure passion. And, you know, it's the same in any form of motorsport. My number one responsibility is the engine. And if, if I don't get that right, then, you know, I won't feel happy about what I've done on the programme, and neither will everyone back at Cosworth. When you're working on something and your name's there and the Lotus name is there, well, you can only think and, and see the Ronnie Petersons, the Graham Hills, the cars shake down on, on this very track for Classic Team Lotus. I've been here 22 years, since I was 16 years old, and when I first started we were building a sprees for Doc Bundy and Paul Newman to race in America. Then jo George Howard Chapel took over our racing development and took the Esprit and the Elise to Le Mans, and I was part of that team as a boy, basically. And now to be one of the people in senior management here at Lotus to actually take a car to Le Mans myself, yeah, couldn't be prouder. Such dedication and such commitment were vital because this was also a race against time. We considered it was um, a 2012 project, not a 2011 project. So it's involved everyone at Castleworth. We have worked days, nights, evenings, weekends to get to where we are now. And we're really buoyed up to go to Le Mans this year. Phase one of a long, a long draw, really. It's only been three and a half, four months since we really started to cut metal with the project. Engines run on the dyno before, but it's connecting you know, 12 miles worth of cable, boxes, everything else, fuel systems into the car. The first thing we want to be is reliable. If, if we're reliable and we show some turns of speed, then that's a good basis from everyone to start to. Okay. The first big test came when the engine was fired up for the first time on April the 6th. Yeah, give it another go. An engine firing, the sound, the noise, the smell, it's that sort of emotive feeling. It's, I don't know, I, I guess it's, it's playing in front of a bunch of people at a theatre or something like that. You feel under pressure, everyone's watching you. It's something being born, very much so, and the engine, as a Cosworth man, is very much the heart of that. It's fantastic because even with the, the modern technology of CAD and things, you can put colour schemes on cars, you see it, you can zoom into the car. There's nothing like actually seeing it, touching it. And I think it's interesting to see how complex the car is and the level of it, that it's such a, even a big step forward from GT4, which when we used to look in the back of one of those, seemed like, wow, this is a, you know, a spaceship. This thing is just unbelievable. When we first started the car up, primarily we were looking at coolant temperatures and oil pressures. What we also need to do is we need to bleed the water system because it's a front-mounted radiator. Um, and thankfully, there were a few air pockets in it. It ran through, everything warmed up nicely, and at the end of it, everything was stable. At that point, we switched off when we got to 90 degrees, checked around everything. You know, we had a bit of heat on the exhaust, but that's all very much part of the development process that we're on. Circulating to first mm. Not sure. It's, it's satisfying for the guys, you know, these guys are working 18 hour days, you know, they're away from their family, their children, and they need little bursts like this just to get them through the next milestone, get them through the next late night. It's like you've had an injection of adrenaline again and you're ready for the next event, so you do need these milestones. They'll come thick and fast now, you know, and the next one will be, you know, when it finally does its first lap around the circuit. That first run on April the 12th on home soil in Norfolk was also the day when the car was properly introduced to the drivers who were going to race at Le Mans in June. The partnership of James Rossiter and Johnny Molam 
blended youth and vast experience of sports cars. Their analysis and technical so feedback would be crucial in developing and improving the car to ensure the fastest progress to the best performance on track. The communication between the driver and engineer, especially at this early stage in the development of the car, is vital and that really is the key to developing a really good and fast car. I really feel that the work that we're doing at the beginning here is really going to set the tone for what's happening down the road. There's a huge, huge hurdle ahead of us, but the more hard work and effort and discipline we put in now, the more we're going to be rewarded at the end, and I'm really looking forward to, to being a part of it. The Lotus entry was going to be Molam's seventh race at Le Mans. He'd already enjoyed podium success at the event. He'd won class victories at endurance classics on both sides of the Atlantic. And he also brought significant experience of different disciplines from different circuits all around the world. An ideal formula for race pace. It doesn't matter how much on a, on a CFD analysis or on the data that you've done something or in a wind tunnel, you can say that's going to be half a second quicker. Ultimately, even with all the modern technology and all the data, the ultimate sort of uh, thumbs up comes from the driver. The first run of any new car always generates a mix of anticipation and anxiety for designers and engineers as much as the driver. Positive first impressions can be an all-round inspiration. Well, I mean, I pull up and I've got 100 things running through my head and I'm sitting there gathering my thoughts and then trying to basically release those as quickly as possible so I don't forget them. For me, it feels like the rear toes out. Okay. And the reason I feel this is because the minute I put any steering angle into the car, I lose the rear. It's quite an intense moment at that point because you do have so many things running through your head and you never get that first impression back of a car and that's priceless. When you turn in and the car is constant, so you have the G-load on the car, everything is constant, the car is nice. I just didn't want to waste any of the thoughts that are in my head and, and give them the information so the engineers can, can make changes and make the car quicker. So for me, you need to drop the rear ride height and maybe put toe in in the rear of the car to help stabilise. Yeah. I have enough feeling for the car, I would like to change something in the car so we learn as we go forward. I've been looking forward to it all week, uh, to be honest, and uh, the car didn't disappoint. Obviously, there's nothing dramatically wrong with it, just loads of little new car things that need to be sorted, and you put all those together and the thing is just going to be a weapon. These test sessions are when the sum of the parts become clear. The chassis, the engine, the balance, the suspension, the performance. From an engine point of view, we're looking at that, that calibration and the map itself, um, trying to tidy that up so that when the driver initially goes on throttle and has got the right response, the fueling and everything is where it should be. Um, we're working on the gear shift yeah, system, yeah. so we're trying to make improvements to the upshifts and the downshifts so that the driver can, can push the car into the corners, downshifting when he likes and can get the drive um, and, and everything that, that he desires. Completing the driver lineup is 25 year old Swiss driver Jonathan Hershey. So the new car for me is a new, new challenge for the GT2 because uh, last year I get uh, all the world championship in GT1. I have uh, experience with 24 hour Le Mans with the Ford GT. And yeah, it's a, a new defi. I think uh, we can uh, get a, a good job this year. I think the, the car has a good, uh, good uh, potential, a big potential, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a big job because GT2 is very high uh, level. And uh, I think yeah, we, we can, but uh, not uh, the, on the first race, I think. But uh, yeah, I think it's kind of competitive on the end of uh, this year. I hope so. Track time in the afternoon, and the car is being pushed more to its limits. The only thing that I think we have to be a little bit realistic about is, in some ways, the car was so reliable straight out of the box that people, are, their expectations immediately raised slightly, and I think we just have to hold ourselves back, be realistic. We're up against manufacturers that have been doing this a long time, and if we were to come out and beat them straight out of the box, I think that would be quite disrespectful to them. So I think we have to accept that, certainly in the early days, we're, we're going to have to work hard to move forward, but the base that the Lotus Evora has is, without a doubt, capable of doing that. It's been an encouraging first test, but the next outing will reveal so much more. It's a six-hour race at the famous Spa circuit.
This event is the first test for the team in race conditions around one of the most demanding tracks in the world. This is where any technical problems have to be fixed. The team have to learn on their feet fast because the countdown to Le Mans is underway in earnest. The race is just over a month away. We need to keep very calm and analytical and, uh, and make sure that we do things step by step and make sure that we evaluate what it is we've got and learn the car because we're still learning the car. Every time we drive in a session, we learn a lot more about this car. Because it's so new, we've had to learn everything about the setup of the car. We've had to learn what its strengths are, what its weaknesses are, and then try and develop those weaknesses to become strengths. Are you picking up quite a bit of understeer with the new tyre? Because I had that in Le Mans a bit. I had more understeer with the new tyre on than I did with the only, old tyres. Only till the temperature comes in. We're under no illusions. It's a steep learning curve, and we, we just want to make a good finish for the race and, uh, and keep moving this Lotus forward, and it's got good potential. Like any new birth of a car, it's uh, a lot of hard work, and we seem to all be pulling together really well, and everyone's getting there, and the car is going to get there sooner or later. When you get on the power, the first thing that goes, the rear will just go, and then it will just slide. It's, it doesn't snap. It just leans and then just starts sliding. The long race, the whole object of the exercise here is to make sure we get to the end of the race, get as much data as possible from the car and take a step forward next time out. Uh, it takes a lot of self-control. You have to really control your frustration as a driver, I suppose, because you're going to be, uh, you're going to be challenging at, at the back to begin with, and then uh, it's going to take a, quite a long time to get to the front, so you've just got to really pace yourself and you've got to realise that all the hard work will pay off. It's almost time for qualifying, and the team is going through its final preparations, fine-tuning procedures and the car for its first competitive run in race trim. Well, we just changed the suspension geometry in the rear of the car, and then we've separated out our rear ride height change as well. I just wanted to know from him the feel on both of those changes, because that's something that we both looked at yesterday and discussed at length. So. It's not about beating your teammates, it's about helping your teammates, and that's sports cars. As qualifying progresses, much work still needs to be done to improve the performance. Drivers and engineers have to work together quickly but calmly to resolve any issues. They need to establish a way of getting things done under pressure, just as they would during a race. Practice needs to make perfect for such a new team up against the giants in the field. But it's not just about improving the car's track position. The team are also gathering and learning vital data for the weekend. Feel good. I don't have much nothing on brake. You feel what? Is there an improvement in brake? No. No, same thing. <laughs> the brakes are the same. The whole car slides a lot through Pouan. Where you turn in, the initial turn in, you have a little bit of understeer, and then as you pick up on the throttle, the whole car just begins to slide to the exit. So, in terms of a qualifying lap or something, it's probably not bad, but in terms of the race, when the tyres get older, I think we're going to have quite a lot of rear sliding through the middle of the corner, but the stability of the rear on the entry is definitely better, I thought. Despite a few niggles, the hard work has paid off. The drivers put together a series of laps which produces a strong qualifying time. Part one of the weekend has gone well. Well, the, the main thing was I just I pushed a little bit more. I took a, a few more risks than you'd normally take, especially on a long run. And uh, obviously the car was slightly lighter with less fuel as well, so that helped a bit. And with new tyres, and I just I just took those calculated risks that I thought we could get away with. I didn't leave any lap time on the table. That, let's, let's put it that way. It was definitely a, uh, a fairly gung ho lap. So much for qualifying. Now to get it right in the race, and the strategy is simple. Stay out of trouble the first couple of laps. We're uh, right in the middle of it. It's a six hour race. No one's going to win it in the first corner. So we just got to do our own race, really, and keep to our strategy. We're going to try and double sin the tyres. So we need to make sure that we don't drive too fast too early on. And we really look after the car, the tyres, and everything to complete the full six hours. Race day, and the team has been hit by bad news. The car has been put to the back of the grid because the team broke the rules by having too many people working on the car in qualifying. It's a tough lesson, not helpful for morale. Unfortunately, James is staying right off the very back. Uh, there was a slight technical error in the pit stops, which was made to start from the back of the grid, so we're not actually in as bad a position as this actually on the timesheets. But no, an amazing achievement by everyone. You know, the team should be really proud.
everything's been in fast forward um, ever since November last year. Team, the drivers, everyone's done an amazing job just to get us here. And now, challenge one is to do six hours with both cars, and then two weeks later, the Le Mans. So no rest after the race either. So barely two months since declaring for Le Mans, the car is set to start its first race. A significant landmark for the team, even if they are starting from the back. But they don't stay there for long. The car gets off the line powerfully, makes up places immediately, and very quickly settles into a strong race pace around the long, fast sweeps of one of motorsport's most famous venues. It's all going far better than anybody on the team dared hope on its debut. But that feeling doesn't last. The engineers are worried because the data shows there's a problem with the engine. Could this be a hiccup, or could it be the start of something serious? Tensions are very high. We're racing, we're trying to win. The problem looks terminal. All that early good work looks like going to waste. While their rivals press on, the car is called into the pits. A few moments later, the signs are even worse. Whatever the problem, there's no easy solution. That's very clear when the mechanics are called on to push it back into the garage. We don't know exactly what happened to the engine. It looks like uh, we lost crankcase pressure, which just shows that there was an engine failure. Um, and then I just drove into the pits and, uh, and the guys brought the car into the garage and, uh, and that was it, unfortunately, for today. We're not trying to, uh, to, to lose. We want to go out there and the first thing Yesterday I said we wanted to do is we wanted to finish and uh, we haven't made that target so we've not succeeded in what we want to do and obviously uh, I'm disappointed, everyone's disappointed and tensions are high but in time we'll calm down, we'll sit down, we'll look at the data and uh, we'll, we'll get better. It was great fun to drive, it, it showed that the car had really good pace in the race, it, uh, it handled very well, we seemed to be very good on brakes and corner entry and it really gave me an opportunity to fight with the other cars, to get in amongst them and to make some overtaking manoeuvres and that was very rewarding considering this is our first race. No, it's definitely not easy, um, especially as the guys have really worked so hard on the car, it's such a shame for this to happen uh, quite well, in, after an hour of the race. It's, uh, it's a bit of a bitter pill to swallow, to be perfectly honest, but um, we'll regroup. We've learned a lot this weekend so far about the car, and uh, we've just got to take what we've learned and, and go and use that knowledge and make the car faster. Yes, um, yeah. In such a situation, you can, uh, you can react in two ways, and uh, at the moment, we're, uh, we're looking to go back to the factory and find out what's happened. There's always positives. There's always positives to be got, got to have negatives. You have to turn all the negatives into positives. It's the only way you can go motor racing. Despite the frustration and exhaustion of Spa, what better to get the heart racing again than the ultimate challenge, Le Mans? <laughs> so we started with the development of the car two months ago. Uh, three weeks ago, we were racing in Spa, but uh, 24 hours is another race. This is our challenge, to compete against the top. There is a lot of emotion here, much more than I've experienced in many other places. It's an amazing experience and uh, I'm just trying to take it all on board and deal with it as best I can. This is the second race this Savora has ever done and it's the Le Mans 24 hours. That sums it up. So we're up against it. For us to even get well into the race would be a huge achievement and, and if we can get to the end, it'll be massive. Nobody in the team or the grandstands can miss the sense of occasion as the start approaches. And after all the hard work over long hours, nobody wants the race to end at the first corner. Yeah, you could definitely hear a pin drop. The anticipation is unbelievable from the crowd. There's so many people so quiet. It's going to be a crazy in about a minute. Well, we passed the Ferrari. Get in, John. It's been a good start. The early stages go well. The car looks to have settled comfortably among such high-class company. But there's a long way to go, a full 24 hours. It was amazing. I, I took the car over from Jonathan and uh, went out, had to get myself into the rhythm, and then I actually had, had the transition of going sort of into the dusk, which was a really nice experience. And uh, yeah, it was an, an amazing 
amazing experience here at Le Mans. One of the worst things actually we got quite a lot of oil on the windscreen from the other cars and when the sun came down through the trees all you got was you come through the trees and you just get literally a gold windscreen from the sun when it was so low and you sort of had to look out the side window to see where you were going which is a bit of a bizarre experience but nevertheless interesting. We've achieved over six hours already and the car's going very very well. I've got no worries about the car, just hope that, uh, that we can stay out of trouble really till the end. These are long shifts for the drivers in conditions which change as day becomes night and day once more. Because although I spent a long time behind the safety car, I was also in the car for four hours in total. And uh, so, you know, at least two hours of that I was pushing. So, probably more than. So, it, it was, it's just the difficulty is keeping your concentration when you're going slowly and then trying to maintain tire temperature, tire pressure. Because it's cold at night, I just couldn't do it. So when we went green on the restart, that was actually really tricky because I had no grip whatsoever. And in fact, I actually overtook a prototype who was struggling in worse than me and then he spun off and there was people going off all over the place. I think we need to begin to take care of the car a little bit now. It's getting very greasy. We need to start leaving some braking margins out there because I know from experience that if somebody drops some oil or water or there's a bit of gravel on the track that wasn't there the lap before, if you're braking on the margins, you can get yourself into a lot of difficulty at night at Le Mans. So you have to be even, even more respectful of the track at night. At the moment, I have to say, you know, I don't want to jinx it, but things are going remarkably well. You know, the car's running like clockwork. So hopefully it'll stay like that to the end. The mechanics have been stunning all week. They've, they've worked through the night every hour. I don't think they've had anywhere near enough sleep. And uh, in fact, some of them are taking a quick nap now. Well, uh, <laughs> the moment is uh, quite dream by After two months of job, uh, one race is an incredible challenge. If tomorrow we, we see the, the light again, I think it's a very good job. Still, the dream continues for Johnny Molum's car, but there have been problems for the sister machine. Oscar just had a left rear puncture, which we think is from the gravel. It's very sharp gravel here, and we've, we've got a puncture and nearly hit the wall as well. So, yeah, it's a bit full. We had to change the front suspension completely, so we lost an hour. Dawn breaks, but car number 65 remains reliable. The belief is growing that something special is happening. The Lotus have come here to Le Mans, and already we've achieved what we intended to achieve, which is to run competitively at the greatest race in the world and reliably, and we've already done that. So anything from here is really just a bonus. The most nervous I've been all race, and it's waiting for Johnny to cross the line for the last time. Words can't describe, I suppose, what I'm feeling. It is, it's, I've never felt anything like this before. It's the first time for me. The dream was, I said, if we finish the race, we finish in the top ten. And then also the podium Intercontinental Le Mans Cup is fantastic. I'm so pleased for Lotus and Jet Alliance and all the boys that worked so hard. It, it means the world to them, you know, and this is a fantastic achievement. I, you cannot underestimate how hard it is to finish the 24 hours of Le Mans and to do it in the car's second ever race when we were at our backs against the wall just shows you what this team's made of and what Lotus are made of.